number of years ago, I was filling in in the parishes of St. Martin and Richmond. I think a little bit south and west of here, maybe 20 miles. Two pretty small towns about 12 miles apart, let's say. I first had Mass in St. Martin. Wonderful small town folk, right? At the end of Mass, I did as I normally do, shaking hands in the back of the church, greeting everyone that had come, thanking them for being there. And then finally, the sacristan came and tapped me on the shoulder. Oh, Father, if you don't start get going, you'll never make it to Richmond in time for Mass. It's a tight schedule. So I quick took off my vestments, got in my car, started racing over to Richmond. Another nice Stearns County small town, good people. And as I was driving down Main Street, I looked in my rearview mirror and realized I was being pulled over by the local police. Not a good way to start your Sunday morning. The officer came up to the window and I said, I'm so sorry, officer. I couldn't have been going that many miles faster than the speed limit. He goes, I didn't see you were speeding. You can't pass on the right. I didn't know. Somebody was taking a left turn. I needed to get to church. Now I got a little nervous, thinking, I'm not sure I want to go back to the Abbey with a speeding ticket and a passing on the right ticket. And so I simply asked him, is your mother going to Mass today? He said, she is. And I said, you don't want it to start late, do you? <laughs> Add bribery to the charge. <laughs> he said, Father, no speeding, no passing on the right. Go to church. I promised him I would offer the Mass for him and all police officers, which I did. Now, I thought just a little bit stretching of the law for the greater good was maybe okay. It was a minimum speed limit, right? Our readings this weekend are very much about the law. Jesus continues that preaching of the Sermon of the Mount that we talked about last weekend. So remember, we've heard the Beatitudes. Blessed are those. We've heard be light to the world and salt of the earth. Nice, easy, it seems. And now today we got to the tough stuff. Really where the rubber meets the road in a lot of ways. Jesus is giving a little bit more challenging teaching to all those that had gathered on that hillside. And in a certain way, he lifts up and warns against some very pernicious sins that are so easy to fall into. Anger, lust, and dishonesty. And he says it's not just the letter of the law, 55 miles an hour if you're driving in Stearns County, but it's the spirit of the law that matters. Now you would think as a Benedictine monk, rules might be up my alley, right? We do follow the rule of St. Benedict. It's maybe a bad name for what Benedict is actually doing in that short little book. Often misunderstood, right? You might think that a rule of St. Benedict would be a convenient listing of all the rules we have to follow to be a good and obedient monk. Check them all off and you've done it all right. Not so at all. Benedict, in his rule of St. Benedict, has pulled together the best the tradition had to offer. Develops a framework some guidelines on how best to live as together the monks would seek Christ in community. He does give a few rules. First, or somewhere in the middle, I suppose, he says a monk should have only one habit. 
and you should sleep at night with your knife. I have three habits and no knife. A rule breaker. Monks should drink no wine. But since they cannot be convinced of that, let them have one hemina of wine every day. How much is a hemina? It's the only time in all the script, all the all the ancient writings that you ever hear the word hemina. Left it to the interpretation of the abbot. What does my community need, and how much? I'm making no personal statement on that one. <laughs> Benedict also lists out how many psalms should be sung at each office, making sure that the monks of his tradition would pray the entire Psalter regularly. But then he also goes on to make some allowance because he recognizes that some communities' work might be agriculture, and certain times of the year it would be really challenging to pray so many psalms in the morning. And they might be tired by night, so he begins to reduce and adjust and make sure that they can actually do what is being asked of them. Overall, I think what Benedict is trying to do in the rule is to make sure that his framework is timeless and that it can be lived by humans. Because often if we draw a straight line in the sand, it's very difficult to constantly live by it. Often when we draw that straight line, it's, it, it becomes a challenge of the minimum. What's the least I can do to stay below it, right? To not cross it. What Benedict is doing is challenging us to go beyond the line, to live the life to the fullest, the best we can, even in our human condition at times. And I believe Jesus is recognizing a similar reality in our gospel this evening. I imagine that as he looked down the hill at all those people who had come to hear him speak, all his followers and disciples, he looked lovingly at some very human people, broken, yet filled with God's gifts, all of them energized and ready to follow his commands and do his will as best they can, as we are called to do as well. And tonight, he doesn't preach a set of rules to us, per se. Rather, he challenges us to a way of life. To use a big church word here, metanoia. That our lives are changed, our lives are turned because of our encounter with Christ. And so he uses three very clear examples. Do not kill. Seems like a pretty easy thing not to do most days. Right? If I'm just doing the minimum. Rather, do not be angry at your brother or sister. And if you are, be the first to go seek forgiveness. He even makes it harder. If they're angry at you, you should go and seek the forgiveness and reconcile the relationship. Do not commit adultery. Again, it seems pretty easy most days. Yet there again, even looking can be the sin. Rather, we must look upon our brother and sister with an abundance of love and mercy and grace, recognizing them for their wholeness. Finally, he goes against dishonesty, challenging each of us to be honest to our neighbors and to ourselves. The most compelling response that 
Jesus can offer to any one of us in any aspect of our life is to live out the commandments, to fulfill the law through a spirit of love. Not out of minimalism. Rather to overflow and abound as we lean into our Christian faith. So if you go home tonight and you're thinking the point of this homily was, I can speed or pass on the right. I don't think it works very well to tell the officer, well, a priest told me I could do it. Rather, the point is, don't live life minimally. See the boundaries and expand them by your love in action. Recognize Christ as the fulfillment of all the law because of his ultimate sacrifice of love for each and every one of us, none of us forgotten. And then like all those wonderful humans on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, Christ calls us to participate in the fulfillment of the law of love. And he knows that at times we'll stumble and we'll make mistakes and hopefully if our ego and our pride doesn't get in the way, we can ask God for forgiveness and know that God offers mercy and love. And then as a people who have experienced God's mercy and love, we then in turn go out into the world to be a people of mercy and love. So feel free to break the rules. Feel free to go beyond the minimum if it means you're loving greater and offering greater mercy.